Hello again. I am Diana Caba, Assistant Vice President of Policy and Community Engagement for Hispanic Federation. I'm excited to kick off this final discussion focused on best practices for digital skilling, program curriculum, design, and delivery. In this discussion, a cross-section of accelerated participants will share their best strategies to design and implement a curriculum that results in high job placement and skills retention, including the pros and cons of in-person, remote, hybrid learning models to build a sustainable digital workforce training path towards recovery. I'm joined by nonprofit leaders and panelists, Karina Ayala Bermejo, CEO and President of Instituto del Progreso Latino in Chicago, Illinois, Margarita Avila, Director of Workforce Development at Latino Academy of Workforce Development in Madison, Wisconsin, and Adam Maturo, Education Pet Specialist at Center for Employment Training based in San Jose, California. Welcome. Thank you. Thank Before, you. Thank you. Before we start, I just want to remind everyone that if you have questions, please uh, include them in the comments. Uh, if time allows, uh, grab questions. We can grab questions from the chat or encourage people to grab the mic. Um, so we'll let you know. But um, to get started, I ask um, our wonderful panelists, please um, take a, uh, three minutes, a few minutes to introduce yourself, your organization, and your digital skilling programs. And while we're at it, um, please include um, what, in your experience, are the essential components of designing and implementing a successful digital skilling program. Karina, I'd love to start with you. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. I've learned so much already from the earlier panels and uh, the energy is electric. So um, I'm Karina here in Chicago. Instituto de Progreso Latino has been an anchor in the community for over 45 years. We are really dedicated as servant leaders to ensure that all uh, Latino immigrants reach their fullest potential. And we do that through training, education, and employment. Um, and we're very cognizant that the ever-changing U.S. society and globally requires us to pivot to adjust our programming and are super excited to talk a little bit about our digital accelerator program. Our core education work it includes two high schools. So we have a health sciences academy and we have a justice leadership academy, which um, really catches all of the students whose traditional education did not work out for them. And we have 900 of the most amazing students. And I think what makes Instituto work so well is that we have a pipeline with the two high schools and workforce development in the areas of manufacturing, healthcare, and retail to wrap around the families, right? We, we say that we register the students, but we enroll the whole family. And we have citizenship and immigration services. So the holistic approach at addressing um, learning and, and really the intended impact is to break the cycle of poverty here in our communities. And as an immigrant who came from Metotonico, Jalisco, nothing gives me greater joy than to be able to help families like ours and to show them career pathways that could be the, the lifeline to, to changing the academic situation of families and transforming communities. Part of the work that we did um, here in uh, Instituto with digital learning and accelerating that uh, process was somewhat in the works before pandemic, right? It all accelerated it for everyone. Uh, we serve 8,000 individuals and families. So the access, right, the digital device and having Chromebooks in the hands of our participants was critical. We know that we work from, you know, the three-year-old to our senior abuelito who needs to have, um, you know, we got to meet students where they're at. And I think that the one thing we've learned in rolling out this program is that's where we have to start, right? For many, it's a smartphone. For others, it's learning the the office suite in a really important, uh, connecting it to the professional world, right? We have a, a college of nursing that I didn't even speak about. And it's important to be able to adjust the program to address those needs, right? To be a a, a wonderful, ready to go bilingual nurse, you also need digital skills that are part of your professional toolbox. And meeting students where they're at means different things at different stages. So it, it's been just a, an honor to partner with the Hispanic Federation to be able to address the digital skills and gap of those skills here in Chicago and, and you know, connecting the, the or addressing the connectivity issue, the device issue, and and really wrapping uh, what earlier earlier programs called what the Holy Trinity, right? The connectivity, the access, and um, the digital 
um, divide and really ensuring that that moves together in a way that's partnering, right, has a veil of, of local partnership with um, with CBOs like the wonderful ones represented here today. Uh, I think I answered most of those questions, but um, I, I will pass it over um, back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't worry. We, we have more opportunities to, to continue. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Karina. Um, Margarita, would you like to introduce yourself next? You are on mute. Okay. <laughs> See, we're all learning in this new world technology, uh, you know, especially with the pandemic. Um, but it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation to Hispanic Federation um, and for the great partnership. Um, I'm very excited to be sharing this space here with Karina and Adam and to also learn about their organizations as well and all the great things that they're doing um, in their communities. Um, so my name is Margarita Avila and I am the Director of Workforce Development at um, the Latino Academy and here in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, the Latino Academy started in 2010 here in Madison as a nonprofit organization. Um, our main goal and uh, with everything that we do at the Latino Academy, so we provide quality programming in the areas of education, employment, and well-being. We would like to say that you know, our driving purpose is workforce development. And over the last decade, we have grown to be an, um, a great leader um, or great leader organization here in the community in supporting unemployed Latinos and underemployed Latinos and non-Latinos through the process of career development, um, education and training, job placement, and job retention as well, which is a very important component for us as an organization. You know, when the pandemic started, we pivoted our classes and trainings, and, and we have to incorporate a level of technology and digital skills in all the classes and all the trainings as well. Um, I would like to highlight the following trainings, um, you know, that we have been very successful and the ones that I'll be sharing more information about during this um, panel as well. So those are our commercial driver's license training, uh, which is for students to be able to obtain their CDO as A or B. Our women's career development series, our safety trainings in the workplace and our digital skills classes that we launched um, last year, thanks to our partnership with the Hispanic Federation. Um, and those classes are the, our digital skills training for parents, digital skills for employment, professional online tools for their workplace, uh, and our commercial driver's license digital, digital skills um, training that we, you know, it's a new training that we started at the Latino Academy last year. And it has been very successful, especially because um, CDL, you know, it is one of the uh, top hot jobs in the U.S., not just uh, in Madison, Midwest, but is overall in the, in the U.S. Um, you know, and of course, we cannot do this alone as an organization. We have great supporters. We have great donors, partners, and volunteers, and our great staff that are very committed to support our students, um, since day one, when they, you know, call our organization, I was going to say when they come to our organization, but we obviously we were closed for a couple months. Um, but we we're very excited to be able to provide those service to our community. We always are looking for ways to advance and see how can we better support our community and especially how can we better partner with organization and employers, um, you know, local and nationally to make sure that our participants are able to, you know, apply for the jobs available. So thank you so much, Diane. Wonderful. Thank you, Margarita. And Adam. How thank are you? you. Hi, everyone. Um, so again, my name is Adam Maturo. I'm an education specialist at the Center for Employment Training. So uh, my role includes training of instructors, um, writing and revising curriculum. I do labor market research, um, and I also maintain our online learning management system. So we use Canvas. Uh, so about CET, um, CET has been delivering career and technical education to the community since 1967. Um, and we currently offer 22 different occupational uh, skill programs across our 11 campuses, which are mostly in California, but we also do have a campus in Texas and we have one in Virginia. 
Um, so our digital skilling program uh, basically involved an upgrade and an enhancement to our basic computer skills competency, which is has been a component of the majority of our vocational programs actually since 2010. Um, but we, you know, with the pandemic, we realized that a lot of the content of that component of our curriculum was geared towards what was found in the classroom, right? We had computers, they were all running Windows 7, they all had the same version of, of Microsoft Office, um, and it didn't take into account we had students accessing our, our content through mobile devices, through, you know, different versions of Windows. Maybe they don't even have Microsoft Office, maybe they're using Google Docs. So we really had to take a fresh look at all of this, modernize it, update it, and also create um, assignments, tutorials, videos um, to provide to all of our instructors at all of our different campuses to help them teach this, this uh, updated content. So in addition to that, we also started loaning Chromebooks out to our students. Um, which access is a huge component of all of this, um, as I'm sure you've heard today. Um, and starting on July 1st, we just began giving every student an Office 365 account and email address upon enrollment. So they'll have that to take with them even after they graduate from CET. Um, so, you know, thanks to our partnership with the Hispanic Federation, we're really happy to uh, be able to offer this to our students. That is amazing. Thank you so much for those wonderful introductions. I can't wait to dig in a little more. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure the audience, too, uh, please ask questions in the chat um, so we can an answer those towards the end. So uh, I have a question for everyone. Each of your organizations has built a reputation of high job placement rates for your participants. What aspects of your program design and delivery do you think helps your participants land full-time jobs once completed? Uh, and um, Margarita, I would love to start with you. You are you're, <laughs> you're muted again. I'm going to invite you to unmute. Okay. Okay. I I apologize for that. <laughs> um, you know, as I mentioned before, that uh, at the Latino Academy workforce is definitely a strong component, and we try to make sure with. Everything that we do, our trainings and classes that we host at the Latino Academy, that we, um, you know, that we also incorporate some sort of workforce, um, either, you know, a training or a class, or we invite uh, one of our partner employers to come present to the class. Um, so I think, you know, for us as an organization, it is important and essential um, to, very essential you know, when we come for us, when we start to design a new curriculum or when we start to plan for a new class or training, um, it's important for us that we have those companies at the table as well. So we, you know, we try to invite those companies to make sure that they provide feedback on the curriculum um, because eventually our goal is to make sure that our students are going to be able to obtain those jobs and be able to apply to jobs available within those companies. So we want to make sure that we create, you know, the relationship that we ask, um, you know, those partners or employers, what is that they need, you know, within the industry to make sure that our students are going to be able to qualify for the jobs um, available, you know, once they're able to obtain the certification or once they're able to complete the training. Um, I would like to share just a very quick example. Last year in November, and this was also, you know, thanks to the Hispanic Federation and the support that we were able to um, get to you for, you know, from to you guys. So last year in November, the Latino Academy, with the support, so you know, from local companies here, um, such as the City of Madison, Metro Transit, Like and Incorporated, uh, Wisconsin More Cares Association, um, Canteras IT Solution, and Smetch uh, Auto company here in Madison, they joined um, efforts. So they came and, you know, we um, we were not, I was going to say we sat at the table together, but we were online. So we were through Zoom. We had several meetings where the main goal was for us to make sure that we had a curriculum that, you know, for our students. Um, and this was for the digital um, online class for CD drivers. 
So we want to make to make sure that what we are going to be teaching, what our instructor is going to be teaching in the class is was going to be, you know, what the students are going to be needing once they were going to be able to obtain those jobs after they were going to be able to obtain the license. Uh, we also invited, you know, once we were um, teaching the class, um, throughout the class and it was online, we invited them to come and present. So then our students were going to be able, you know, they were able to learn about the different companies, what are the skills they require for those jobs. And, you know, so they, they could relay the class to the skills and to the jobs. And then eventually, you know, once they were going to be able to obtain their um, CDL, so that they will be able to have that on their resume. They, you know, they attended this class, completed this class at the Latino Academy. And we want those employers to see, you know, the value of the class. Um, so I think that, you know, definitely a strong component to have those employers and companies at the table when it comes to develop an, a new curriculum. Thank you, Margarita. Karina or Adam, uh, would you like to also respond to that? We are both shaking our heads, Margarita, mm -hmm. you're spot on, having the business partners through the journey and really understanding what the jobs are, what the skills are necessary for that, because when you have an employer on the journey and attending your graduations, it really helps with 100% job placement and building those relationships that are deep and meaningful. That with... Um, the support services that you provide the students while they're on the journey, right, towards employment as they're getting the skills. Um, we know that uh, what Instituto does really well is, is assigning, right, uh, the case manager to our students so that we can remove the barriers, right? That's our, that's our duty. That's our, um, you know, the important role that we serve to be able to ensure that there are, um, that we're removing the barriers as the students, um, you know, share with us during their, uh, their welcome and, and as we're triaging some of the assistance that they need in order to succeed as a student and to make sure that they're focused on the digital literacy and skills that are um, being, you know, <clears throat> participating in. It's logical, right? There's going to be barriers. And um, we've been able to remove those barriers because we have benefits, uh, specialists, employment specialists, case managers that ride along the journey with our students so that if they miss a class, we understand why. If a class later in the day is more amenable, that we make that happen. So um, that coupled with the really wonderful relationships with employers um, has the high placement and, and really the high completion rate of the programs uh, for us. Adam? I think you probably were shaking your head right along. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, um, yeah, job placement is super important, important for us. I mean, we're center for employment training. So for us, uh, job placement is, is an imperative. We're actually required by our accreditor to maintain at least a 70% training, re training related job placement rate for all of our programs. So if we slip below that 70%, um, any one of our occupational programs would be triggered. And then we would have to go in and evaluate what is causing this to not meet the placement rate. Is this occupation still in high demand? Um, do we need to take a look at the program content? Do we need to update um, the skills that we're teaching our students? So, so that, that may happen. Um, and that's happened in the past. And and we'll reevaluate. But uh, like what Margarita was saying, um, having your employers at the table is super important. Um, so we have what we call technical advisory committees for all of our programs. So we have local employers um, in the industry meet with us twice a year to review our curriculum. They review our, our tests. They look at what equipment is in the classroom. Um, and they comment on that. And sometimes those employers might even have donations to make to you. You know, they might have equipment that they're not using anymore that would be a great fit in your classroom. So those kind of relationships are super important to foster, um, not just to get their feedback, but also as a pipeline to employment. Um, and we also employ industrial relations specialists at all of our campuses. And so their job is to work with the students on uh, building their resume, 
Um, they do mock interviews. They help them write a cover letter and a thank you letter. And they practice all of these skills. And then they'll actually go and help them help our students to get those interviews. And, you know, if one interview doesn't work out, they'll help and try to find them another interview until they get placed. Fantastic. I feel like we, we got so many takeaways from, from that one question, you know, the, the relationships, the supportive services, um, the connections, that, that job prep as well that's essential along with the training. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, and, and speaking of supportive services, I, I did have a specific question for you, Karina. Um, many of the jobs that disappeared during the pandemic are being replaced by jobs that require more technical skills during the recovery. How is your agency addressing the digital divide and the need for more digital healing? And also in what ways did you have to pivot your, pivot your programming to address the needs of your community? I mean, I feel like we you touched upon this quite a bit, but I know that you know we had a conversation too, especially about those super, supportive services yeah. that are key. Oh, so that is such a, a brilliant question. And part of the, I think the opportunity here is that we understand that a lot of the, you know, creating a digital ecosystem that is going to help sustain and include Latinos is so critically important and that we got to be inpatient and it's urgent. You know, what we learned was that those skills that or the jobs that were disappearing quickly, right, because Latinos didn't have the luxury to work from home, right, retail, manufacturing, um, hospitality, small businesses, and then looking at how to how to help that population that was hit the hardest. And for us here at Instituto, it was really about, okay, those jobs will be coming back. Let's take this opportunity as a time to really um, use those digital skills and learn them in a way that's going to help you in a career that you want. For some, it was reevaluating careers, right? And, and making changes. For small business owners, it was getting them the assistance that they needed to be able to then get on, you know, a, a, have a website, have a digital presence that they might have not had previously. Part of what um, what Instituto did in conjunction with that and, and working really closely and meeting students where they were at was the support services. And I talked briefly about it. And the support services are that, right? Anything that a student needs from um, child care, which we know continues to be um, a, an issue. Instituto has on-site child care. We, we know that parents um, were juggling not only digital skill learning, sometimes a job, and then sometimes the, on -learn, the, uh, the online learning that their students were doing at home. So how can we make that easier? Because we have case managers that accompany every student and they have these regular meetings. Um, and I think that your industrial relations person, Adam, sounds very much like our employment specialist person, right? that you're investing in the time to get your digital skillings up, but we are guaranteeing you that you're going to get a job because we have an employment specialist who is working with you hand in hand. And we have a case manager that's removing some of the other barriers, whether it's transportation, whether it's a gas card, whether it's food, right? We turned into a food bank. Instituto never did anything like that. We fed um, nearly uh, 80,000 individuals since the start of the pandemic. We knew um, that our students are telling us we need food, right? And uh, we haven't even begun to talk about the mental health issues that our, that our students were facing, right? That they needed some help there. Um, and that uh, all of that is now online, right? Even to make a medical health appointment, we needed to address those barriers. And we had a team of support um, specialists to help our students along that journey. So yeah, it's um, it has been an incredible blessing to be able to provide those basic um things as food and rental assistance, but it was surrounded around, you get through the digital skilling aspect, you're gonna be better off than you were pre-pandemic because we don't ever wanna have you stuck in a poverty um, survival skill type of job and we wanna get you into a career. And we're really successful doing that, especially in healthcare, um, taking folks at early um, ESL in health and working very closely to then our associate's degree in nursing so that um, the digital skills necessary at every phase of that journey is addressed. So, fantastic! I, I, again, really honing in on on the fact that wraparound services, uh, the, the, the services that we provide uh, through our organizations, are so critical. Because if someone someone's coming in for one thing, they most likely are going to need support with others. And and at the end of the day, what do we want to do? We want to make sure that we're guaranteeing that success, right? Not just not just providing a temporary solution, but really providing those tools uh, 
for, for our overall well-being. Thank you, Karina. Uh, Adam, I had a quick question for you in regards to um, the move to online learning, because I know that that was something that you that CET was implementing prior to the pandemic. It's like you had the foresight <laughs> that, that you needed to, to go online or have your programs go online, whether it was a digital skilling program, uh, something or tech-specific program or not. Could you please talk about that process and how you were able to maintain the quality of your programs and services? Sure. Um, so as I'm sure is the case for a lot of you, the pandemic was sort of like a trial by fire. You know, we were, um, we went from all in-person classes to everyone being thrust into this online remote paradigm just overnight. Um, so prior to the pandemic, we only had one of our programs approved for hybrid instruction, which was our medical clerk program, but we were already using Canvas but only for our standardized assessments. So we had the framework there. We just had a bunch of empty online classes basically for everyone to use. So at that time, our instructors were kind of, um, you know, some of them are more tech savvy than others. A lot of our instructors come directly from industry. You know, um, they, they might be HVAC technicians and, and now they're teaching HVAC, but they're not, um, not necessarily all of them are, uh, computer lovers, let's say. Um, so immediately when we shifted to online, I was basically training instructors like boot camp of how to create assignments in Canvas, how to uh, make a quiz in Canvas, how to record a video in Canvas. Um, you know, from March 18th, the next two weeks, it was just nonstop you know, remote trainings for instructors whenever they could attend. So I think training for your staff is really key. Actually, I think we found that some of our students in some cases are more tech savvy than our instructors. Um, so really ongoing training for your instructors is important. We've done more follow-up trainings, um, sometimes with the Instructure Canvas staff um, throughout the year, year and a half since. Um, but the other thing to really help transition to online is, uh, we leverage our network of schools. So we have 11 different campuses and a lot of our, our programs are offered at multiple campuses, like medical assistant, right? We have that at seven different campuses. So what we did is we tried to really, um, strengthen that network of instructors um, we created sandbox courses where instructors could share their assignments to one another and, you know, to work, work smarter and not harder. And, and to really, um, so I kind of started curating really the best assignments and videos and things that our instructors were creating and then pushing them out to all of our campuses. Um, so that, that's the way we've done it. Um, it's definitely been a challenge, but I think we're, you know, or a stronger organization for it now. Definitely. Uh, a, a lot of head nodding also <laughs> during your response, and, and especially when it comes to about training staff, um, because I think all of us across the board, uh, nonprofit organizations, when we had to do, do the pivot, um, the panic to pivot, uh, realize, you know, we also had to make sure, you know, we were well equipped, right, to then be able to, to provide these programs and services uh, remotely. And then now as we... Are embarking in these hybrid models um, to make sure that that we're reaching folks, taking advantage of this opportunity um, to reach more folks through that, but also maintaining the quality of our program. So thank you, thank you so much, Adam. Margarita, question for you. So Latino Academy of Workforce Development has a heavy focus on jobs that are hands-on, like you mentioned, the commercial driving uh, license program, restaurant management. How were you able to deliver the programming during the pandemic and maintain the interactive? elements of your trainings? Yeah, thank you, Dan. Great question. Um, you know, I think the pandemic, it, it happened and surprised not just to, you know, us Latinos or nonprofits, but to all the whole world. Um, we, we just, you know, there were so many things that we had never done before, like provide teaching classes online, a lot of students, they didn't even have an email. So we were in conversations even before the pandemic that, hey, this is going to be needed. Why don't we, you know, request that is necessary for our students to be able to have an email. So now we are forced to definitely our students need to have an email. 
uh, which is, you know, a great tool, a great resource resource as well for our students to have. Um, so, you know, when the pandemic started, our organization, we probably took about two to three weeks to just kind of plan and how we were going to move forward. Um, and then we communicated with our students. You know, our students were used to just come to our office and, you know, um, mainly, you know, use their phone or call or line our office. Uh, so it was a chat when we had to close our office um, and then start providing classes online. We had no idea what we we're, what were going to be expecting, if our students were going to be able to connect. Uh, but we communicated, we sent out resources on how to join our classes online. Um, the ones that we were able to provide online. Uh, and then as our students were able to, you know, either use our computers or phones, or we were also um, able to land them Chromebooks, um, uh, you know, from the Latino Academy if they didn't have one at home. So to make sure that they were still going to be able to connect to the class. For those classes, um, so for our food management certification class, our wonderful instructor was able to, you know, pivot the class and then provide, you know, the class online. So that was excellent. Um, but for other classes as uh, our in, um, commercial driving license, we had we were able to provide the class online as well, but we had to stop our driving practice for three months um, because obviously, you know, the, it has to be in person. Um, things that we were able to do thanks to technology is like send e videos to the students. Um, so our instructor was able to communicate with the students, you know, via email and just keep them engaged and just provide information, um, online information and online tools and resources. So they were not, you know, stay behind for those three months and then come back. Uh, we, we had no idea when we were going to be able to come back. But eventually, you know, after three months, um, we were able to, from, you know, bring the driving practice back, the training back, um, totally different because before the students were able to have this training in groups of four. And then um, when we kind of got back, um, the students had to meet one-on-one -on -one with the instructor. So that is just taking more, you know, resources and time with the instructor as well, because now, uh, you know, we had to change our trainings as well. Uh, so we still made it happen and we're still moving forward. But we definitely had to implement uh, different resources, different um, practices to be able to provide those trainings. Thank you so much, Margarita. Um, so we are nearing the end of the conversation, but I wanted to take advantage of some of the questions that came in through the chat. Um, one of the first ones was actually when we were talking about, you know, um, connecting folks with jobs. Uh, and this uh, uh, Terry in particular is concerned about um, people having the necessary professional dress for job interviews. Um, is that something that um, you've seen, you, you've helped folks with, or, or or is that another opportunity to be able to assist our communities and, and, and guaranteeing their success and getting the job? For sure, absolutely. You know, and it depends on the type of job, but um, that would be something that we would have triaged and addressed during the, the case management session um, to ensure that that isn't going to block. And then we do provide um, professional dress if necessary. And some of them is uniforms, right? So we, we assist with that. But it's, again, about removing as many barriers as we can to ensure success. Absolutely. Great. Uh, another question. Uh, and feel free, whoever would like to answer, uh, from CP. Do you integrate families into these programs to ensure the candidate benefits from family support structures? So this is for those with, with, with helpful families. So I guess basically like it kind of lends to the question about the wraparound services and, right. and, 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 you know, maybe some, some one person comes in for, you know, a training, but then they have other family members that can benefit from other services. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, I, if I could just add, you know, something that we at the Latino Academy, if we don't have those resources, obviously, you know, when we have participants, they might have, they might have more needs or they require more support other than just to take a training or a class. Um, so if we don't have those resources or we don't provide those resources at the Latino Academy, we have great partners that we can refer them to, uh, you know, our local partners here as well. Excellent. 
And I see one, one last question uh, from the comments. So um, this, this one is specifically for Adam. Uh, uh, folks want to know a little bit more about Canvas and, and how that supports your digital skilling students. Oh, you let me, you're on mute, Adam. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so Canvas is uh, is an online learning management system. Um, some schools use Blackboard or Moodle, or um, I'm sure there's others, but basically it's it's just an online framework for you to offer uh, online classes, or you know you can use it for hybrid instruction or even in person. But um, it'll allow your your instructors to upload assignments, create quizzes, um, you know, broadcast announcements to their class, and and things like that. Um, so for for digital skilling, now we have our, our basic computer skills as a whole module within Canvas. We have links to all these different um, tutorial videos and assignments and, uh, and other resources that our students can access. Excellent. Thank you so much. So as, as we wrap up what has been a very insightful conversation, uh, I just wanted to ask, you know, if there, one, one last general question, feel free to answer. Um, what additional programs or services do you feel are needed to build the resiliency and strengthen the economic prospects of Latino families in the communities you serve? Like what, what's, what, what, you guys do so much. <laughs> so I wonder, you know, what, what, what else do you feel uh, is needed? If I could take that uh, uh, holy uh, trilogy example to a higher level and making sure that ev not just every family has a digital device, but every individual within that family needs to have that digital device, that connectivity, and then the digital skills. And taking the family approach at learning and um, having the the students who are likely more just uh, used to technology be a participant in that family training. So I think when you think of it as a whole and a family opportunity to, to learn together, that it sticks more, right? And that you're supporting each other and that you have to think beyond the device per household. It has to be every single individual. Um, yeah, I think so in terms of additional programs or services that, that we would like to offer, um, We've been discussing with some of our campuses in Southern California, especially the ones that serve a lot of farm workers. Um, they've expressed an interest in offering um, ESL classes or computer literacy, or uh, maybe including civics and basic math um, as a standalone program, which is which would be new for CET because all of our programs are are vocationally oriented right now. So that's something we're we're exploring. Um, I think access is still super important. Um, even with our Chromebook loaner program that we've started, um, based on our most recent student satisfaction survey, we found that even still around 50% of our students are still only accessing um, Canvas through a mobile device. So we still have work to do there. Um, and we've also found that since the pandemic, a lot of our students actually like the flexibility that remote learning gives them. And a lot of them, I think, um, might even prefer that, especially if they, they have children or if they're working part-time. So we're really looking to get a lot more of our vocational programs officially approved for hybrid delivery. And if I can just add to your question, Diane, you know, something that um, our organization would like to make sure that we're providing more trainings, uh, more advanced trainings, in technology to make sure that Latinos are also at the table with, you know, they're able to obtain those jobs uh, with Google, you know, with big companies. Um, since we're still behind, you know, there are not many Latinos out there working for tech companies. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, we one day we're able to provide those trainings uh, with, an, you know, a certification for our community to make sure that they are able to advance and be able to, you know, advance in their career and be able to apply for those jobs in the tech industry. Absolutely, thank you all so much. Um, such amazing work by all and still so much work to do, but I commend you all. Um, and thank you for taking the time to join us and sharing your insights uh, with the audience. 
And we, again, just thank you again for a, a fantastic conversation. Uh, I'd like to pass the mic to Brent Wilkes, uh, my colleague who will provide closing remarks and let us know how folks who are in attendance today uh, can earn the chance to win a Google Chromebook. Speaking of Chromebooks, <laughs> don't miss out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you everyone. Diana, amazing work. Adam, Margarita, Karina, uh, really, really inspired by your messaging and the work that you're doing. And thank you so much for helping our community at a time of need. So this is this has just been fantastic. I think the whole the whole session has been wonderful, and we'd love to hear from our folks uh, to talk about um, you know what what they felt was most impactful and um, what types of wisdom they were able to gather from um, this conversation on Latino digital skilling. Um, so we would like you to, um, uh, you will receive a link, each person att attended today, uh, to complete a survey and tell us, um, you know, what their uh, feedback was like um, sure. and and to let us know uh, what they thought and what they gathered and what, what, we, th what we were able to do to, to help improve programs, um, serve the needs of Latino communities. Um, so when you submit your survey, make sure you include your name um, and then, of course, um, your address because we will be entering you into a drawing to win a Google Chromebook. Uh, so we'll need your contact information so we can let you know if you won. Um, then immediately after this session, uh, we invite you to join us for a virtual mixer where you have the opportunity to network and connect one-on-one -on -one with other attendees from across the country. Uh, using this Run, Run the World platform, uh, which we hope you enjoyed. Uh, we'll be introducing you and matching you with someone who's uh, new every five minutes. So make sure your camera is ready um, and you're ready to, ready to chat. Uh, again, thanks to all of our incredible panelists and speakers. You've been outstanding, and we really appreciate you being here today. And gracias. We'll see you soon at the next uh, event, which is the Mixer. <laughs>